So I'm going to ask Miss Blakely Hatcher to join me down here. Blakely is a sixth grader at Willie J. Uh, got a text message uh, a little over a week ago now from her mom saying, hey, we just want to let you know that we were at the house and Blakely says she's given her life to the Lord and wants to follow through in baptism. And there's not a better text uh, that I would say that I can get uh, from any of our students and their families. So we're excited to celebrate with her this morning. If you are a member of her family and you're here in celebration with her, we would just ask that you stand uh, during, her, uh, during her baptism. All right, Blakely, what is your confession this morning? Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Based upon your confession, I baptize you, my sister, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Maybe one of you are here this morning and, and you have a relationship with the Lord, but you've never followed through with baptism. We would love an opportunity to talk to you about just the importance of that step of obedience. Let's continue on with our service. Try that again. Good morning. Amen. This week as I was preparing the order of worship, the thought came to me, why do we worship? And I wanted to share this with you this morning because I came across something and it meant something to me as I read it. And I wanted to share it with you. We worship because we want to glorify him and show him how much we care about what he has done in our lives. Amen. We worship because it is a, it is a way of saying, I love you. And we worship because it is a way of saying thank you. We worship because it's a way of saying you are worthy. So this morning, we would like to worship alongside of you through song, prayer, and scripture. Would you stand with me as we sing, O Come All Ye Faithful.
Would you be seated, please? I don't want to get stuck behind, there we go, I don't want to get stuck behind the kids as they come in, so I'm going to stand down here. Um, but we're so excited that you guys are here to worship with us this morning. As you can tell, the kids are coming in, they have a special um, few songs for you guys, but um, for the welcome, if you are a guest and you look in the pew in front of you, there's a connect card. We would love for you guys to fill that out. Um, this is an opportunity for us as the staff to connect with you. Um, we won't do anything crazy. We just want to reach out and invite you back. Um, but like I said, this is for us to connect with you, which means members or longtime attenders. If you have any prayer requests, if you have any prayer requests, please fill this out. We love to pray for you guys, and we want to pray for you all. Um, also, pay attention. We have some um, dates, some times changing for the next three services. We won't be having an 815 service, so keep that in mind. Um, but all the updates are in your bulletin. So please look at that and check that out. Um, we have been reading through the Bible, and this year, or this week we're reading 1 Timothy and some of uh, 1 Peter. And the verse that we're putting to memory this week is 2 Timothy 2.15. If you would please read it with me. It says this. Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who has no need to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. Let me pray for us, and then our kids are going to sing for us. Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for allowing us to come into your house and worship you, God. Thank you so much for, um, for allowing us to hear these kids sing as they sing praises to you, God. I pray that um, it's, it's a time of joy and a time of remembering you um, and a time to remember Jesus. So, God, I pray that our hearts and our ears are open to what you have to say to us. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's go see. Let's go see. And there were shepherds living out in their fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord was show around them, and they were terrified. But the but the angel said to them, Do not be afraid. I bring you good news of great joy that will be for all the people. Today in the town of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger.
Suddenly a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to, glory to God in the highest, and on earth peace to men on whom his favor rests. God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. John 3, 16.
parents so much for bringing your kids every Wednesday so that we can do that. And um, it couldn't happen without Miss Stephanie, Miss Whitney, and Miss Bessie. They do an incredible job leading choir. And um, all of our Wednesday night volunteers, I know if I start listing off names, I'll, I'll forget someone because that's how it works. But um, we have an incredible list of Wednesday night volunteers that help to make this happen. So if you see them, thank them. Um, but right now what we're going to do is if your kid is up here, stand up so they can go find you. And we are also going to dismiss for kids worship right over here at this door. So parents, go ahead and stand up. And kids, you guys are dismissed to find your parents.
So are you thankful that you came to worship today? Well, I, I don't know about you, but I am. Uh, it's been a wonderful, wonderful morning together. Thank you to our kids choir. Man, what a great job that y'all did. Thanks to our volunteers, adult choir, as always. I'm so thankful for, for my faith family here at First Baptist Church. And I'm thankful for the opportunity to serve the Lord alongside of. If you have your Bible this morning, let me ask you to go with me to the Gospel of Matthew. Matthew chapter 1 will be our text today. Matthew chapter 1. While you're finding your place there, uh, let me just kind of give a little bit of an introduction. So today we're going to switch gears a little bit. Uh, we finished up the book of Esther a couple of weeks ago. Of course, J.R. preached last week, did a fantastic job on uh, speaking from Matthew chapter 6 on the topic of worry. Well, today we're going to embark on a new journey, and I told the 815 service I'm going to do something today that most pastors don't do, probably because they're a lot smarter than me, and that's start a series in December. Uh, most pastors kind of preach a couple of Christmas messages and save a new book for the first of the year, uh, but uh, given our subject matter, uh, I think you'll see why we're starting today. Over the last few weeks, as I was just praying through where the Lord would have us to go next, the, the Gospel of Matthew was just heavily laid upon my heart. There's so much in the gospel that, that Jesus teaches us and shows us about how we're to live for the sake of his kingdom. And so as I began to, to wrestle with that and kind of plan that out, uh, it seemed fitting. Why not go ahead and start now uh, in the month of December since the first couple of chapters deal with the birth story of Jesus. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to begin a series today called Your Kingdom Come. And really that's the gospel of Matthew. Lord, your kingdom come. Jesus is the king and he's come to reign and he calls us to take part in building his kingdom here on earth as we await his second coming. So today we're going to jump into the opening chapter, Matthew chapter 1. Uh, this morning we're going to cover a, a, a kind of a chunk that has to do with the genealogy of Jesus. But as we begin, I just want to read one verse. So if you have your Bible open, follow along with me. The verse will also be on the screen, Lord willing. Matthew chapter 1, verse 1. Listen to the word of the Lord this morning. Matthew writes, he says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Would you pray with me this morning? And we'll take a look at God's words together. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you, for, Father, for the opportunity we have to gather together to study. God, to sing praise to your name. To listen, Father, to our children as they sing your praise. Father, I'm so thankful for our church. I'm thankful for what you're doing in our midst. I'm, I'm thankful, Father, for the way that you're uh, growing your kingdom here in our context. And God have called us to be a part of that. And so this morning now, as we open up your word and look and see what you have to say to us, Lord, I just pray for clarity and understanding on our part. Father, help us to know what it means that you are the king, and God, that you invite us into your kingdom. And I pray that you would just teach us today and help us to live out what it is that you've called us to do. And ask this in Jesus' name, amen. I don't know if any of you <clears throat> are the type of person who enjoys doing this, but uh, some people really enjoy doing family histories. Um, you know, anybody like to do that, like Ancestor.com type stuff and go back and look at your descent, uh, kind of your forefathers and stuff? A few of you do. Uh, I've never really done that. I've never really gone super far back into my family line. It's always something I'd, I'd like to do. I've just never taken the time to do it. But, you know, whenever you go through your family history, you know, your grandparents and your greats and your great, 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 greats, and as far back as the records will take you, it's interesting what you can find. You know, a lot of times, though, you'll, you'll find a bunch of names that really don't mean a whole lot, right? People that you've never heard of may not have any sort of written records other than maybe a name and a birth date. But occasionally, if you're lucky, you kind of stumble upon a name in your family's past that, that jumps out. Maybe, maybe, some, something that, maybe somebody famous, maybe you're kin to a president or something. It'd be my luck. I'd probably be kin to an axe murderer or something like that. It's probably, that's why I haven't gone back in my family history, but you never know, right? Never know what you're going to find when you look at the family history. Well, here in Matthew chapter 1, Matthew gives us essentially the family history, or let me clarify, the earthly family history, if you will, of, of Jesus. And as we're going to study today, as, we, as he opens up this gospel and as we look at this passage of Scripture, we're going to see a bunch of names that may not mean a whole lot to us. We may see a few that do. But let me just encourage you, as we begin this journey, as we look at this text, you may be looking and saying, man, this is just a whole bunch of names that don't mean a whole lot. When we look at these genealogical passages, let me just remind you of something right before we dive in here. When we look at passages like this, we need to remember, we did the same thing when we studied the book of Esther. We did the same thing in the book of Joshua. When we come to these passages of names, remember this. We come to these books, we come to these passages, and what do we tend to do? We tend to look and say, I don't understand that. There's a bunch of people I don't know. I'm just going to kind of jump right over that and get to the good stuff, right? 
But let me remind you, every word in the word is inspired, it's inerrant, it's intentional, it's there for a reason, it's there to teach us something. And so even today, as you look at this passage of scripture with all these names that you may not know how to pronounce, we're going to take a look at it. And we're going to see that God has this passage of Scripture in this book for a reason. And we're studying it today for a reason. And ultimately, Matthew's point is this. As he gives us this genealogy of Jesus, it's really our big idea today. And it's not just today's big idea. It's really the theme of Matthew. Look at it with me. Today's big idea is that Jesus is the promised king who came to reign and restore. Jesus is the promised king who came to reign and restore. We're going to see that today in this text, and we're going to see it throughout the book of Matthew. So let me encourage you to open up your outline with me and follow along as we walk through this passage of Scripture together and see what's in the name of Jesus. What's what's the big deal about Jesus' name and his family history? We're going to see several things today. I hope they encourage you, and I hope they teach us to, to trust in Jesus even more. Here's the first thing I want you to see as we look at the family history and the line of Jesus here in Matthew chapter one. First of all, see the highness of Jesus' name. See the highness of Jesus' name. Verse one, Matthew opens up this book. He opens up this gospel by saying the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, that opening phrase may not seem to jump off the page at you. It's not some grand theological treatise necessarily, but it's incredibly important for a couple of reasons. First of all, Matthew tells us what he's doing. He is giving us the book of Matthew, this gospel of Matthew. He says, here's why I'm writing it. It's the book. I'm writing a book of the genealogy of Jesus. He gives us the story of Jesus. The word genealogy there in the Greek literally is the word genesis. It means the beginning. So he says, I'm giving you the beginning here of the story of the earthly ministry of Jesus. Now, I'm trusting you're here today. Most of us know who Jesus is. Most of us know the story of Jesus. If not, you can continue reading in the Gospel of Matthew and see all that Jesus did. But understand whom Matthew is writing to. Matthew is writing to a Jewish audience. He's writing this book. He's recording this after the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Jesus, if you go to the end of the book, has ascended into heaven And so Matthew is writing this record so that he can convince his Jewish audience of one thing, and it's the big idea. He's convincing them that Jesus is the king, and he tells us this in this opening phrase. Notice what he says. He says, the book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ. Now, let me just remind you of something if you didn't already know it. Christ is not Jesus' last name, okay? Like, you know that, right? Uh, Like Matt Peake, Christ is not Jesus' last name. No, Christ is a title that's ascribed to Jesus. The Greek word for Christ is Christos, Christos. What it means is the anointed one. It means the Messiah. It means the promised one who has come to save. And so don't miss this. This is incredibly important for today's lesson. As we look at this passage of Scripture, here's what Matthew's saying. He's saying, guys, I'm about to tell you the story of Jesus and how we can know that he is the Christ. How we can know that Jesus is the anointed one. How we know that he is the Messiah, the king who has come to reign and who has come to restore and to rule his people. And so right off the bat, Matthew lays it all on the line. He doesn't veil his intent. He says from the start, guys, Jesus is the king. We lift high the name of Jesus because he is the king. He is the Messiah. So we see the highness of his name, but look secondly with with me at what we call the the heritage of Jesus' name. See the heritage of Jesus' name. You know what it means to to name drop, don't you? Like you're having a conversation with somebody and you're talking to them and you just kind of happen to throw in the person that you talked to, some famous guy, right, or somebody that you had dinner with, you know, kind of like this. It'd be like, well, you know what? I had dinner the other night and you know what? I just happened to have dinner with Durwood Dominey, the voice of the Packers, right? The voice of the Golden Earth. Name drop, right? Just slide it in there just so people know your status and know how important you are, right? Maybe you know some famous people, maybe you don't. But we like to drop in names to kind of let people know how important we are. Well, here Matthew in verse 1, he slides in some names, and these names are pretty big. He drops some big names. Look at verse 1 again with me. It says, The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Now, I can mention those names to you, and you probably know who they are. You know who David is, right? David and Goliath, the great king of Israel. We know who Abraham is, right? We know the song, Father Abraham had many sons. We shake our right arms and our left arms and that kind of stuff. We know Abraham, the father of the Jewish people. But if you think that you know about Abraham and David, and if you think that those names are important to you, imagine how important those names were to the Jewish people centuries ago and even still today. You could not drop 
two bigger names to the Jewish people than David and Abraham. And so what Matthew's doing here is he is intentionally saying Jesus is related to David, he's the son of David, and he's the son of Abraham. And if you look at this whole chapter, what does he do? He gives us this family history, all the names we're going to get to in just a moment, but notice how it's structured. Look at your Bible with me for a moment. As you look at verses 2 down through verse 17, Matthew structures the genealogy of Jesus around those two names. The first group, 14 generations from Abraham to David, then from David to the exile, and then from the exile to the birth of Christ. He structures the entire genealogy around the names of David and around the name of Abraham. Now, let me just take this moment and say this. Maybe you're here this morning, and maybe you're a serious Bible scholar. Maybe you're smarter than me this morning, and you know more about the book of Matthew and more about the genealogy. And maybe you're saying, but aha, there's another genealogy. Yes, you're right. Luke has a genealogy in his gospel. And at first glance, you may say they don't look alike. Is one wrong? Is one not right? Understand something here. Matthew is giving us the genealogy going back from Joseph to show that Jesus is the rightful heir to the throne. He's giving us the royal lineage of Jesus' family tree. That's his purpose. That's his goal. He's highlighting the connection that Jesus has with David and the connection that he has with Abraham. So let's look at those connections and look at why Matthew does it. Look with me, first of all, at how Jesus is the son of Abraham. Verses 2 through 6. Look at the, the link here from Abraham down to David. Matthew writes, Abraham was the father of Isaac, and Isaac the father of Jacob, and Jacob the father of Judah and his brothers. Judah the father of Perez, and Zerah by Tamar, and Perez the father of Hezron, Hezron the father of Ram, and Ram the father of Amminadab, and Amminadab the father of Nashon, Nashon the father of Salmon, and Salmon the father of Boaz by Raham, and Boaz the father of Obed by Ruth, and Obed the father of Jesse, and Jesse the father of David the king. All right, lots of names. You may not know how to pronounce them. I don't either. Say it with confidence. Nobody knows the difference, right? That's my secret. I've told you that before. We go through the names, and what do we see? We see a lot of names that we may not know. We see a lot of names that we do recognize. But ultimately, see the bookends. He starts with Abraham. Matthew intentionally draws the line from Christ all the way back to Abraham to show a point. He's wanting to show that Jesus is a descendant of Abraham. You say, well, that's, that's you know, Thanks, Captain Obvious, right? Jesus is a Jew. Why do we need to know that he's descended from Abraham? All the Jews are, right? Yes. Why does Matthew highlight Jesus' connection to Abraham? It doesn't just have to do with the fact that Abraham's the father of the Jews. It has to do with a promise, a covenant, a promise that God made to Abraham all the way back in the book of Genesis. Go back with me, if you will. It'll be on the screen if you just want to kind of make a note of this. But Genesis chapter 12, verse 1. Listen to the promise God made to Abraham, generations before Christ. Now the Lord said to Abram, or Abraham, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great, so that you will be a blessing. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Did you hear the promise? Hundreds of years before the birth of Christ, thousands of years, here's God speaking to Abraham and saying, Abraham, I'm going to bless you. You're going to be the father of a great nation, and in fact, really the father of many nations as they're blessed through you. I'm going to make your descendants more numerous than the stars in the sky and the sand on the seashore. Abraham, I'm going to bless you, but did you see the promise at the very end? Abraham, through you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. Here's what that is. It's a promise of one who would come through Abraham's line who would bless the entire world. Ultimately, it's a promise of the Messiah who's going to come and bring salvation to all people who trust in him, and he's going to come through Abraham's line. So here's what Matthew's doing. As he begins that genealogy in Matthew chapter 1, he's going back to Abraham, back to the promise, and he's pointing to Jesus and saying, Jesus is the fulfillment of the promise to Abraham. Jesus is not just tied to Abraham, he's the son of Abraham, and he's the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham so long ago. But then he moves on to David. He says that Jesus is not just the son of Abraham and fulfills the Abrahamic covenant, he says he's also the son of David. Look with me at verse 6 he, as he begins with David and goes down through the exile. Verse 6, David was the father of Solomon by the wife of Uriah, and Solomon the father of Rehoboam, Rehoboam the father of Abijah, and Abijah the father of Asaph, and Asaph the father of Jehoshaphat, and Jehoshaphat the father of Joram, and Joram the father of Uzziah, and Uzziah the father of Jotham, and Jotham the father of Ahaz, and Ahaz the father of Hezekiah. 
and Hezekiah the father of Manasseh, and Manasseh the father of Amos, and Amos the father of Josiah, and Josiah the father of Jeconiah and his brothers at the time of the deportation to Babylon. So we started with Abraham. Now he's highlighting David. Before David, after David, he gives us the generations from David all the way down through the exile. During this period, all the kingly lines, right, from David, his descendants, all the way down. Then he gets to the exile in verse 12, and he continues from the exile to Christ. Look at this with me, and then we'll draw the connection. Verse 12, after the deportation to Babylon, Jeconiah was the father of Shealtiel. Shealtiel, the father of Zerubbabel. That's one of my favorite names. And Zerubbabel, the father of Abiud. And Abiud, the father of Eliakim. And Eliakim, the father of Azor. And Azor, the father of Zadok. And Zadok, the father of Achim. And Achim, the father of Eliud. And Eliud, the father of Eleazar. And Eleazar, the father of Methan. And Methan, the father of Jacob. And Jacob, the father of Joseph, the husband of Mary, of whom Jesus was born, who was called Christ. All right, we got it out of the way, right? I guarantee you on Christmas morning, you probably don't read Matthew chapter 1 as part of your Christmas story, right? You kind of skip to Luke 2. But here's why Matthew's giving us these names. Again, started with Abraham. Now it's all about David. Leading up to David and following David all the way to Christ. Again, why? Not just so we can say, oh, cool, Jesus is related to David. That must be nice. No, there's a promise here. We can go back to the life of David And we can see during David's reign as king, at the height of the kingdom of Israel, David was the greatest king they ever had. And what does God tell David? David God makes David a promise. We see it over in 2 Samuel. Look at 2 Samuel 7, verse 16. David, if you remember the context, David wants to build the temple. He wants to build a building for the glory and the worship of God. And God tells David, no, it's not for you. It's for your son to do that. But then he makes David a promise. What does he say? Verse 16. David, your throne, your house, and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me, and your throne shall be established forever. In other words, David, your line will not fail. You will have a descendant who reigns on the throne. In fact, you will have a descendant who reigns on the throne forever and ever and ever for all eternity. In other words, it's a promise. David, someone from your line is going to come. It's a promise of the Messiah, the one who's going to come and save, the one who's going to come and reign, the one who's going to have his glorious kingdom set up for all eternity. And again, here's what Matthew's doing. He's saying, guys, Jesus is the fulfillment of that promise. He's the son of Abraham. He's the son of David. He fulfills both of these covenants, both of these promises. Jesus has that heritage for a reason. Now, you may be looking, and maybe you're a wise guy this morning, and you say, aha, but I've got you now, pastor. Because you look at this, and you say, what's the problem here? If Jesus, if this line is traced back from Joseph all the way through, what's the problem? Well, Joseph was Jesus's, he, he was not his blood father, right? We know that Jesus was born of a virgin. We're going to see that here in just a moment. So what do these promises have to do with Jesus? Here's why. If you look at the Jewish culture and the Jewish context, Jesus is the recipient of these promises. Why? Because he is, the legal, he is the legal son of Joseph. If you look at the law, it doesn't matter whether he was adopted or born or any of the above. He is the legal son of Joseph. And so what Matthew is doing here, he's saying it doesn't matter the bloodline. Jesus is related to Abraham. He's related to David by legality. And because of that, he is the fulfillment of those promises. And he alone, no one else, can stand as the king. We see the highness of Jesus' name. We see the heritage of Jesus' name. And Matthew highlights it there in verse 17, one last time. So all the generations of Abraham to David were 14 generations. From David to the deportation to Babylon, 14 generations. And the deportation to Babylon to Christ, 14 generations. Why does he say it again? He's saying to us, and he was saying to his original audience, Jesus was not just some random Jewish boy who was born in some smelly stable in Bethlehem. He's saying, no, Jesus is the fulfillment of all of the Old Testament prophecies. He's the fulfillment of the covenant that God made to Abraham and to David. See his heritage. But more than that, more than just a family link, more than just a family story, we start to get personal because we see something else. Number three, we see the humanity behind Jesus' name. We see the humanity behind Jesus' name. You know, anytime that you do a family history or a genealogy, you know, we've all, got, we've all got some relatives that we're proud of, and then we've all got kind of that crazy aunt or that crazy uncle, right, that we may not be so quick to say that we're related to them. We all have some, some people in our, in, our, in our family, right? Maybe you're the person. Maybe that's why you're having a hard time saying it. <laughs> but, you know, when you take a look at this list of Jesus' family tree, you know what you see? You see Abraham, you see David, 
But you see some other interesting guys and gals. Jesus' family tree is filled with some unique people. But there's three themes that are highlighted here that really give us some hope and some encouragement today. Look at them with me. First of all, in Jesus' tree, we see a mention of, of females. His line mentions females. His line mentions women. When you look at the genealogy passages in the Bible, but even really in Jewish culture at large, most of the time they would trace their line back through the dad. It was a patriarchal society, right? Women did not have as much status in society back then, so you didn't really mention the mom in the genealogy. But what do you see here? I've highlighted it on the screen for you. If you look at all these verses, we see there are five women mentioned by name. We see Tamar, we see Rahab, we see Ruth, we see Bathsheba. Now, she isn't mentioned by name, but she's mentioned by description. She's the wife of Uriah. And then, of course, we see Mary. Five women mentioned in this genealogy, which would have been incredibly unusual. Why is this a point? We're going to see it in just a moment. It's a message that Jesus came to save all. We see a mention here of, of females. His line also mentions foreigners. His line mentions foreigners. It's the same passage of Scripture. When you look at all these verses, we see a bunch of kind of True blue blood Jews, right? Abraham and David and all these guys that were just, you know, everybody wants to kind of cling to and link to. But then we also see some people who aren't Jews at all. In fact, all of the women, with the exception of Mary, none of them were Jews. You see it on the screen there. Tamar and Rahab were both Canaanites. You can go back to Genesis. You can go to Joshua. They were not Jews by blood. If you look at Ruth, she was a Moabite. And if you look at, um, if you look at Bathsheba, she has a Hittite background. None of them were true blue blood Jews. And again, you look at this and say, well, what's the big deal? I mean, you know, why, why are we making a big deal of this? It's because of this. There's a message here for us saying, just like Jesus came to save all people, including men and women, he came to save all people, including Jews and non-Jews. It's a message of hope for us who are Gentiles this morning. But there's one more thing I want you to see here with me. His line doesn't just mention the ladies, and it doesn't just mention people who weren't Jews. His line also mentions failures. His line mentions failures. When you start with Abraham... And you go all the way down, David, to the exile. You know what you see? You see a story of broken people doing broken, sinful things. I mean, that list, I mean, look at the descriptions up there. I just picked a few and put them on that title screen. I mean, we've got liars. We've got cheaters and swindlers. We've got idolaters. We've got wicked, wicked kings who did wicked, wicked things. And you say, oh, yeah, but what about the good guys, right? I mean, there's David and there's Abraham. Well, tell me about David, a murderer, an adulterer. Tell me about Abraham, who lied about his wife. Abraham, who decided to short-circuit God's plan and go his own way. The line is filled, it's replete with people who fell short of the glory of God and did broken and sinful things and failed to live up to the standard of God's holiness. Jesus' line is filled, every single name. All those names that you don't know how to pronounce, they're all sinful and they're all broken. And you know, when we look at that, we say, oh, well, that might be a problem, right? Because all the way back to Adam, ever since Adam and Eve sinned in the Garden of Eden, we know the concept of original sin. Sin is passed down from every generation to us, right? We sin because sin is inherent to us by our sinful nature. But here's the good news. Even though Jesus' family line includes all that sin and all that brokenness, guess what? God had a plan. And we see it in our fourth point. Look at with me, number four. See the holiness in Jesus' name. See the holiness of Jesus' name. Although Jesus' kingly lineage is traced back through sinful and broken people, I want you to see how Jesus comes. Verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. Don't miss this. This is incredibly important. What Matthew is saying is although Jesus is Joseph's and Abraham's and David's descendant by lineage and by legality, he is not their son by birth. And therein lies our hope because Jesus does not inherit the sin nature of his earthly fathers. He does not inherit that sin nature of Abraham and David and Jeconiah and all the other wicked people in that text. No, Jesus, because his father is in heaven, God the Father, through the virgin birth, Jesus can live in holiness. He's not doomed and cursed like every one of his forefathers from an earthly standpoint. Jesus lives in holiness and perfection. And so here's the point. We're going to talk more about the virgin birth some as we get to Christmas. But look at what Matthew's saying. 
in verses 1 through 17, he's highlighting the earthly lineage of Jesus. Jesus is the legal king, but listen to me. Verses 1 through 17 don't mean a thing without verse 18. Verse 18, the virgin birth of Christ, gives us hope that Jesus is not bound by the sin and the curse. Look at what's on the screen there with me. It's in your outline. The virgin birth allows Jesus to maintain his royal human connection without losing his divine perfection. It's God's master plan for Jesus to be a man who can live and inherit that kingly line, but also to live in sinlessness and perfection and ultimately to be the propitiation for our sin. It's a beautiful picture of the wisdom and the sovereignty of Almighty God. And it's all right here in Matthew chapter 1. You know, you may never have read Matthew chapter 1 and seen any of this. And you may think, I've lost my marbles. But here's what I want you to see more than anything. It's where we started. In Matthew 1, G- Matthew writes to the Jews, and by extension, he writes to us. And he's got a point, and it's very simple. That big idea, what is it? Jesus is the king. Jesus is the king, and he came to reign, and he came to restore. He fulfills all those promises. He fulfills all those covenants. He can trace his line back. He alone can righteously rule because of the virgin birth. He checks every box, and there's no one else. There's no one else who can make those claims. But here's where we've got to do something important. If you notice, we've gone back to a big idea, which usually means we're wrapping up, but you may have one more blank on your outline. In fact, I know that you do. There's one more thing that we need to see. Listen to me very, very clearly. As we look at Matthew chapter 1, the goal of this text, as I often say, it's not for our information, it's for our application. The goal of this is not so that you can learn more Bible trivia to impress your friends. It's not so that you can pronounce hard to pronounce biblical names. What's the goal of Matthew 1? It's to show us who Christ really is. He is the Christ, he's the Messiah, but even more is to lead you and I to respond to that truth. Which leads to number five. What do we need to see? Number five, put your hope in Jesus' name. Put your hope in Jesus' name. When you read Matthew 1, look at the claim Matthew's making. He's saying this Jesus, the guy who was born in the the manger, the guy who lived and was crucified, that guy, he says he is the Messiah. Here's the proof. Here's the family line. All the evidence is laid out there. Now listen to me. Here's what you cannot do. You cannot take that claim and ignore it. You can't just say, oh, well, that's nice. That's your opinion. I'm going to go my own way. There's a divergence here. If you were in Matthew's original audience, you have a choice. Number one, as a Jew, as a faithful Jew who honors the name of God, you can either look at Matthew and say, blasphemy. He is not the son of God. He, you, know, you reject him, you choose not to follow Jesus, and you think Matthew is not only crazy, but you think he's a heretic because he's promoting a God in someone else. Or you look and say either Matthew's wrong or he's right. And if he's right, if Jesus really is the Messiah, if he really is the Son of God, if he really does check every box for the lineage all the way back to David and Abraham, if he really is the fulfillment, if he really was virgin born, then you know what you can't do? You can't sit there and act like that doesn't matter at all. You either reject it or you receive it. That's the choice. And so for you and me today, as we read this passage of Scripture, we're faced with that choice too. And so lastly, I just want you to see two quick things with me as we we wrap up and just by way of application. As you're faced with the choice of what am I going to do with this information, what am I going to do with the truth that Jesus really is the Christ? Number one, when we think about putting our hope in Jesus, understand that Jesus can relate to us. Why are the details of Matthew 1 laid out the way that they are? Matthew could have just stopped at verse 1 and says, hey, he's the Messiah. Now, let me tell you about how he went and was baptized and did his ministry. But no, he spends a lot of time giving a lot of names. Why? He wants us to see Jesus's earthly connection. He shows us all these names. You remember the names? Broken people, outcasts, foreigners, women who didn't have a place in society, all these things. Jesus' line is filled with brokenness. And you know what? Maybe yours is too. And maybe it's not just in your family tree. I guarantee you it's probably right here too. Every one of us has brokenness in our story. Sin in our past, ancestors who didn't walk according to the word of the Lord, even in our own lives, what do we have? We have brokenness and failure. But what do we see? 
if Jesus can redeem those things, if he can overcome that past, guess what? He can overcome yours. If he can take all those people and redeem their story, he can redeem yours. Jesus can relate. He lived an earthly life, fully man, right? Fully man, but at the same time, fully God by the virgin birth. We'll see that second point that you see there. Jesus can also redeem us. Just because his family was broken and sinful doesn't mean Jesus was. You listening to me? Jesus was perfect, holy, sinless. No one else has ever been able to make that claim except him and him alone. What Matthew wants you and I to see is this. Jesus isn't just an interesting guy with an interesting story. He's the king, fulfills all the promises, and he's come to reign and he's come to restore and to make all things new. So my question to you is, what are you going to do with that information? Are you going to walk out of here and say, man, that was a really neat thing. I never understood the family tree of Jesus. Or are you going to say, I'm putting my hope in that truth, that Jesus is who he says he is, and that he alone checks that box. You know, maybe you're here today, and maybe you've never made that decision to follow Jesus. Maybe you've heard the Christmas story, you've sang the Christmas carols, but maybe you've never made the decision to place your faith in him for salvation. You understand, if you don't, you're just like all those other broken people. You have no hope apart from Christ. But he is the Christ, and he's made a way for you to be saved. Will you trust him? But maybe you're here today, and maybe you know Jesus. Maybe you're a believer. Let me just encourage you to just glory in the beauty of the sovereignty of God in sending us Christ the way that he did it. God's perfect plan satisfies every requirement, and it shows us we can trust him, And it shows us that he loves us unconditionally. So will you put your hope in him today? Will you pray with me? Father, I thank you for your word. And God, I thank you for, just for its truth. God, Jesus didn't just randomly pop on the scene. God, he's existed from eternity past and he'll exist for all eternity because he's the king But God, even as he came to the earth, he came according to a set plan. And God, even in that plan, all the way back, the family line, we see your sovereign hand. We see hope. We see hope for sinful people. Hope for broken people. People who are down and out. God, we see hope for people just like us. So Lord, I pray that you would help us today to Rejoice in the truth of who Jesus is. And I pray that even today, if you've never done it, God, today will be the day that we begin to follow King Jesus. Lord, you're good. And we thank you for your goodness to us in Christ. Help us to respond to your word now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen.